Hi, it's Heather from Thick It Works, and today I'm going to be sharing a little of my process for this cigar box shrine that I've titled Acceptance. We'll be looking into the design process, and I'll share a few of the techniques that I've used as well. To begin this process, I'm using a cigar box and a wooden candle holder. To mount the candlestick to the base of the cigar box, I'm just finding the center and marking it with a Stabilo All pencil. That will allow me to come back with an awl and a little chasing hammer and create a dimple in the center there. And that dimple will make it easier for me to use my drill without having the drill bit skittering all over the surface. And now it's time to reach for the trusty DeWalt drill that has this super cool quick release. And get that hole taken care of. Now I can run a nice long wood screw through the bottom of the cigar box and into the base of the candle cup on this wooden candle holder. Once that's in place, I'll use Instacure, a really high quality gap filling cyanoacrylate glue to keep that bond nice and tight. I always appreciate an opportunity to use up jelly prints, so I've trimmed and folded an old jelly print so that it will cover the back and both sides just using tacky glue to get that into place and a little bondo spreader to smooth it out and make certain we have a good bond. Now I'd like to turn my attention to some of the assemblage components. This will be a lintel at the top of the shrine. The addition of some self-adhesive rhinestones in the background will add just a hint of sparkle. This shrine has a theme of acceptance and death as a part of life is something we all have to accept. The inclusion of this little skull casting will help to emphasize that point. Here, glossy accents are being added around the rhinestones. This is a great adhesive for working with microbeads, which is the next step here. I'll be creating a kind of nest of microbeads around these rhinestones and that will create a beautifully textured background for our little death's head to nestle in. The extremely fine texture of the microbeads adds so much richness. 3D Matte Gel is the best adhesive I know of for adding protruding and heavy elements from an assemblage like this. You just butter the back of the piece and press it into place. I like to use a damp, fine gauge paintbrush to just smooth out any of the squeeze out that you get. Since this stuff dries to a transparent finish, you'll never know it was there. To emphasize the eyes in the skull, I'm adding a couple more drops of glossy accents and a couple of flat backed pearls in a rich bronze tone. I'm also filling up the space around all of those rhinestones with more microbeads. The focal point of this shrine will be this face. It's a paper clay casting that's received just some distress stains as an initial pigment layer. I'm going to obscure all of that with black craft paint, followed by Inca gold in old gold. So I'm going to try some do-it-yourself rust paste over this gold finish. And, you know, it could be horrible or it could be cool. We'll just see what happens. I'm just using an old acid brush, which is completely rusted out. And I've trimmed back the bristles on this thing so that they are very short and stiff, but a little bit angled. These rust pastes are very gritty and textural. So I'm hoping for a nice 
juxtaposition with the shiny metallic here. We'll see. All right, I think that's enough for the first coat. I'll go ahead and dry this with a heat tool. Okay, I think that's pretty good. I'll just rinse my brush and then come in with this color of rust paste. I don't, oops, I've got too much water on my brush. All right, let's try that again. I don't want to obscure all the dark gray that I've already added, but I do want to break up that expanse of pigment. Just adding a little nuance to that darkness. Now, of course, rust doesn't happen on a gold or brass surface like this. Virtually nothing happens to gold except maybe a little mellowing and darkening, but bronze or brass develops a patina, not a rust, although both, of course, are oxidization processes. But this is a fantasy finish. This is not trying to mimic anything that actually happens in the wild. This is just me having fun with texture and pigments. All right, I think that's enough of this dark sort of brick color. You can hear how gritty that is. <laughs> More heat tool. And that didn't take long. That feels pretty crispy and dry. So finally, I think I'll use just a tiny bit of this sort of bright yellow pumpkin color. Nothing alarming. Again, I just want to break up any areas of monolithic color. There we go. Good enough. I'm liking the effect and I'm liking it so well I think that I will continue to use it in various ways on this little shrine that I'm making here. Let's take a look at it again. Now Initially, I was thinking of placing this emblem at the top of the shrine. It, of course, has more of a copper color to it, and that is probably not how I'd like it to stay. Somehow, I'd like to mount this face in the interior and have some flowing lines as well. I haven't worked out a design at all in my head. I'm just going for it. But I think that we'll see the Inca gold and the rust paste make more of an appearance as we go on here. Now, because I've already added bling and microbeads to the center of this motif, I don't feel very confident about adding a whole bunch of gold in this area, but I think that we can add another layer of Inca gold over the edges of this to help harmonize the look with this piece. I'm gonna give it a try anyway, and I'll just be using my fingers as I usually do with Inca gold. Now I don't mind some of that delicious copper showing through. I think that just gives it even more richness. But I do want the overall tone to favor a gold or brassy feel rather than copper. And that certainly didn't take long to change it up. I'm liking it, but you know what? I think this 
black skull could benefit from a finish that resembles this one. It's pretty small, so I may have difficulty pulling it off, but I'm going to go ahead and go for it, at least by adding Inca Gold to the high points. Okay, I think that's about all the gold that that guy needs. And now we're a little more harmonized. What's missing, of course, is rust. So I'm going to repeat the same process by beginning with this dark charcoal rust paste. But of course, because this is such a small surface, I'm gonna have to be pretty judicious in how it gets applied. Not something that I'm terribly good at, but we'll see what happens. I don't know why, but I feel like making sort of veins of oxidization run across this piece. Obscuring some, but not all, of the metallic highlights. Okay, I'm gonna stop there cure that with a heat tool and we'll move on and now it's time for this deeper sort of brick red rust paste and then lastly just a tiny bit of this highlight color nothing too crazy but enough to break up the expanse of darker rusty pigments. That ought to do it. Great. Okay, so these pieces have been harmonized and I'm liking the effect. So I'll set those aside for a few minutes and I'm going to turn my attention to this cheap wooden candlestick that forms the basis of this shrine. and. I'd like to add a similar treatment to this portion of the piece by beginning with Inca Gold. But this is an awful lot of surface area to cover, so I'm grabbing a baby wipe. And I'm doing that so that I can pick up the Inca Gold sort of on this pad created by the baby wipe and cover a larger area in one fell swoop. Not interested in perfect coverage. But I do like the idea of a metallic gleam that will send a bit of shimmer and shine through the final surface which has rust effects on it. I'll set that with a heat tool. So it's time to go back to work with the rust pastes. Again, I'm not being too fussy about it but I am attempting to establish a little bit of sense of flow by working on diagonal lines. This rust paste is dry and we can go ahead and add more layers there. But before I move on, I wanted to discuss this, which is papers that I laid down yesterday and had a bit of a disaster with because I used too much glue. I knew I was using too much glue, resulting in tons of wrinkles. So I went back over it with a hasp or a rasp to beat up that surface. And you know, that's okay, but I think that I'm gonna work with the rust paste at the base here and flowing up these side walls and the back wall as well. So I'm going to take a few moments to add a layer of dark rust paste 
over that disaster and up some of these walls. And I'll be using a palette knife for this since it's such a large area. It just doesn't make sense to dab away with a tiny little paintbrush when you can just slather it on like icing a cake. Now, this will take a lot longer to cure than these little dabbed layers down here, but that's okay. It's gonna result in some really cool texture and hopefully by bringing it up the walls just slightly, it'll help to carry the theme or at least cohesive use of similar materials throughout the piece. Okay, yeah, that's the effect that I'm looking for. Just kind of a reverse drip from the bottom up. Maybe the way that uh, mold tends to develop on surfaces. Yeah, that's good. Now, the back wall I can't do with this because, of course, it's entirely the wrong shape. But a small piece of credit card like this, I can absolutely pick up some of that rust paste and then drag it up that back wall. I want to make sure to get that corner covered. There we go. So I think we'll allow this dark layer at the bottom to establish a pretty heavy center of gravity here, but allow it to become lighter as it moves upward. So I've allowed this rust paste to dry for about 45 minutes and it's still slightly damp. In the interim, I've added Inca Gold, Old Gold, to the cover of this Iron Orchid Design Decor Mold. And I'm thinking that a placement something like this will eventually work for this particular piece. Now, while we continue to wait for this to set up, I think it's time to begin the process of covering the rest of the surfaces of this little cigar box. And I've just grabbed some old jelly prints and stenciled papers and I'm going to be working with these muted, grungy tones to cover the exterior. Um, and these that have a stark black and white feel to them, I'm probably gonna knock back with a wash of some kind of warmer tone. Haven't decided yet, but in the meantime, we can go ahead and get started actually getting the papers glued onto the surface of the box. And I'm thinking this sort of mysterious dark paper might be a good choice for the sides of this piece. There's enough here that we can get two strips out of it that will cover these side panels nicely. So I'll worry about that in a minute. I'll set that aside. Not sure about this one yet, but I'm thinking that this sort of steampunk motif will be a good selection for the rear of the piece. And rather than try to cut this to fit, I'm just going to go ahead and affix it in place and then trim away the excess once I've decided which orientation I would prefer. And I think I'm gonna go for this orientation right here. Now I do have a sticker at the bottom here that I'm not thrilled about having on there. So I'm gonna take this metal cooking tool and just use that to pry up the edge of this sticker and get rid of it. I'll grab a gift card and some Aileen's Tacky Glue the quick dry version in this instance and I'll be using this with a little more discretion than I did yesterday 
I was just going crazy with the glue. I don't know what my issue was, but I've regained my senses. Now this jelly print is on regular printer paper, but because it has a nice skin of acrylic paint on it now, it's pretty substantial. And it's not as fragile as you might think. Okay. So now that we have adhesive on there, I'm going to line this up as best I can. And taking a Bondo spreader, smooth that paper against that adhesive. One thing I love about working with jelly prints for applications like this is that because they are covered with acrylic paint, the surfaces are quite robust and you can do a lot of smoothing with a tool like this and not really be concerned about marring your existing mark making. Tough is good. I'm not typically a very delicate creator. So now that this is thoroughly adhered and I don't appear to have any weird lumps and bumps from the adhesive, I can go ahead and trim away the excess. And for that I'm just going to use an extendable blade knife, pierce right through and cut along the edge. Now this won't be a perfect cut, that's okay. I'll be coming back and sanding that edge eventually. Now a little bit of glue has seeped out along this lower edge, making it a little goopy to cut away the paper, but I'm going for it. And because we have a lot of paper hanging over this edge, I'm actually gonna use a metal file to help clean that up. Now the rear is completely covered and we can move on to the sides and the top. Oh, and I have roughed up the surface of this particular cigar box with an emery board prior to attempting to glue anything to it just to give it a little bit of tooth. Something for that adhesive to grab onto. And again, this is a jelly print made with acrylic paints. So that surface is pretty tough. And I can use a Bondo spreader without worrying about damaging it. That feels pretty smooth. And to neaten these edges, because I know that they're still damp, rather than using sandpaper, I'm going straight for the metal file. There we go, that's good enough. On to the other side. So in a really short amount of time, we've covered this exterior with some cool papers, and we're making some real progress. going to cut a few strips of this pattern paper for the front edges of the piece. Now this area here and at the bottom these are going to be covered by these castings. So I'm not concerned about adding additional papers here. It's going to be just fine like that. This interior is still 
drying a little bit. I feel that it's cool to the touch, although it feels rough and dry on the surface. That coolness indicates that under layers are still pretty damp. So I'm not going to mess with it. Instead, I'm going to concentrate on further treatments to these exterior panels of paper. The first thing, of course, well, maybe not of course to you, but to me, is that these white strips, although they have interesting patterns, are way, way too stark. So I think what I'll do here is use a coffee stain to knock this back a little bit. So I'm going to grab some stain made with instant coffee crystals. And just that little bit of pigment is going to help this feel less stark and more integrated with the other surfaces here. And we have the same feeling of starkness to my eye and just knock that back a little bit. Of course, there's still a feeling of stark contrast between the white papers and these dark, rich blue and black and gold papers. But I'm, I'm liking that. I think that those lines of demarcation are a good thing, and I'm not gonna interfere with that effect at this point in the process. However, one thing I am going to do is extend this rust paste around the lower edge of the entire piece. Yep, I'm happy with that. And I'm going to let this dry naturally, but it'll take several hours. So I will set it aside and I'll come back and meet you here once this is ready for the next phase. So this piece and the rest of the carcass of the shrine have had a chance to set up. In the meantime, I've added the first layer of rust paste to this guy, and I'm just going in with a little bit of secondary color to break up that dark brown. Since I'm adding such a tiny amount right now, it won't take long at all for this to dry with the heat tool. Come back with the third layer and this one will be ready to go too. I'll set this aside and let this final just highlighting layer set up naturally. And let's take a look at the carcass for the shrine. Okay, so yesterday I got all of these papers added to the surfaces. That's good. And then finished up the day by adding rust paste around the base here. Before I go any further, I'm going to come back with some of the Inca Gold Old Gold at the top margin of the piece. Now I add essential oil to my Inca Gold and Try to keep it as moist as possible. This stuff definitely has a tendency to dry out. If that happens, don't throw it away. I've created a little 
video tutorial showing you exactly how I reconstitute them. This one, for example, was a cake of nothing but hard and unusable solid wax just a few days ago. But with a little work, you can bring it back to full functionality. Now, you don't have to apply Inca Gold with your fingertips. It's just my preferred method, probably because I'm lazy. Um, I like the effect that I can get, and I don't mind getting dirty fingers. Nothing too deliberate with this layer. I'm just creating a sort of metallic upper edge that is drifting down. Just coming back and putting a little more at the very upper edge. I'm not going to bother with this surface right here that's going to be completely covered in the long run so it's not an issue okay yeah I'm liking that effect that's good and it's creating a bit of an echo between the base and the surfaces that we see here and since these surfaces have completely dried I can now come in with my secondary colors for the rust paste both in the interior and around the exterior. This little area right here also will not be exposed in the final design so I'm not going to pay any attention to that. Now yesterday I used a palette knife for the initial layer and I've started out using a brush to stipple on some of the lighter rust color here but I'm thinking I'd probably rather grab the palette knife again I really like the effects that that can give so I'm picking some up on the edge of my palette knife and now I'm just scraping it upward I don't want to cover all of the paste we put down yesterday but I do want to break it up and add variations of color now for this area I'll take a cut off gift card and use that to spread away from me and I'll also use that to spread up the back wall okay so now I'm gonna dry all this with a heat tool we'll come back and do a little bit of highlighting and move on This poor brush. <laughs> One of the reasons I like working with these little acid brushes is they're super cheap and you don't have to feel guilty about treating them with a certain amount of brutality, which I certainly tend to do. And I'll set this aside to continue setting up. In the meantime, I have something I'd like to do to this little label casting. And that involves using some cheap lace trim that's been completely coated with acrylic metallic in gold. It's very stiff but I think it will make a really nice edging for this piece. So 
So the intention is to add this at the base of the opening and have the lace peeking out beneath and creating a sort of scalloped edge here. I think it's worthwhile running this trim around the entire base. For this, I'll be using Fabri-Tac. Yeah, I'm enjoying that effect. And once this is in place, we'll have some nice layers going on here. That kind of complexity really pleases my eye. Good. I won't be installing this right now. I want to continue working on the interior, but it's a good idea to test fit these things ahead of time. I haven't yet decided how I will be embellishing or even if I'll be embellishing the roof or upper surface here. I'd like to see something interesting emerge from that area. But for now, I think it's time to turn the attention to the interior of the shrine. Again, I'm not sure how this is going to progress, but I know I'll be using this piece as part of what happens inside here. I'd like this piece at the top and this at the bottom of the aperture. Boy, it's hard to see in that harsh sunlight, but I think you get the idea. Now, first thing that occurs to me when I look at this piece in here is that it looks really stark and kind of crude. And those are qualities that can be really cool, but it's not what I'm aiming for with this piece. I want something that has a little bit of nuance. So the task now becomes how to integrate this really strong piece into this background in a way that's both meaningful and pleasant to look at. So I'm going to spend a few minutes digging through my stash and locating items that I'll come back and play with. We'll audition them as we go through the assemblage process and see what works best. So I'll meet you back here in a few minutes. Okay, so I've been playing with some components and I've made some decisions. One of the first things that needed to be dealt with was an engineering consideration. This piece is pretty heavy. It's made of paper clay, but it's still substantial. And as you can see, it's a really unconventional shape and one that doesn't lend itself to actually mounting to a flat surface. So I decided to cut a length of sturdy cardboard tube. That's going to fit into the rear of this piece and allow it to be mounted flat. I'll be using Fabri-Tac and probably a bit of Instacure as well to mount that in place. So that's good, one problem solved. Next, I discovered one of these funky little cheap frames, you know, the laser cut balsa wood or whatever this stuff is, really thin plywood, I think, um, in my stash. And although it's a pretty design, it's also very one-dimensional. There's no surface treatment here, but it does fit nicely around our focal. And I think that with the right surface treatment, this could be a good choice. So I grabbed some funny little half round sort of flat back pearl things that I got at the dollar store. And I'll be using these to add dimension to portions of this little flat frame. 
once it has dimension on its surface, I'm going to take it outside and hit it with a coat of Rust-Oleum two-time in black. And then we can come back in and add even more layers of texture and pigment. But to start that process off, I just want to see some dimensionality on this piece. And of course the color doesn't matter because I will be spray painting the entire surface. I won't bore you as I continue to add these little half rounds to the surface here, but I'll come back and show you the result before I spray paint it. Okay, so I've added a bunch of super cheap flat back pearls on the surface of this guy. And I'll head outside and we'll do a nice full coat of black primer. Okay, so this little frame has now been primed, and this is the stuff. I love it. Rust-Oleum two time. And this bonds to just about everything. The only thing I've ever had difficulty with are those little sort of bendable plastic animal toys. For some reason, that plastic tends to develop a really sticky surface if you prime it with this stuff. So for those, I would definitely turn to a dedicated plastic primer, but for just about everything else, this will do the trick. All right, enough of that. So this feels more interesting to me now that we have some texture going on here, some dimension. Um, this little mounting piece has been just dry fit on the back of the face and I think the effect is going to be interesting. We'll see. We'll do a little test run here. Here's the carcass of our shrine. Place this guy first and then gently add the frame and yeah I'm thinking that looks pretty darn good I'm gonna zoom out just enough so that we can see more of the piece and then dry fit these little labels as well Yeah, okay. I'm thinking it's really not going to need much more. That's hard for me because I really love to go a little out of control when adding bits and bobs to these assemblages. But I think in this case, keeping it simple is going to be more effective. Now, having said that, I may decide to put additional pigments on this. I'd probably be happier if we had some metallic going on here and maybe a little bit of the rust as well. But things are going in the right direction. I also found something else in my stash that I think that I'll be using. This is uh, what amazing casting resin and this is just a little architectural acanthus leaf molding piece and I think I have just enough to go along the sides and the back here at the top. Now do I want that or do I not want that? I don't know I think it's kind of cool and the reason I say that is because I, I like the balance that it introduces to the design and frankly I, I like a little more decorative stuff on my pieces rather than just flat adhered papers although you know I, I like this effect I just gotta have me some layers so I'll be trimming this to fit and putting that around this upper edge and I think that that will be the very next thing 
that I tackle. Okay, I've just divided this piece of trim into three pieces and the corners are going to look really rough so I've grabbed just some off cuts from some die cut metal tape and I'll be using this material to disguise how ugly those corners become. So Fabri-Tac and I'll add a couple of drops of Instacure on here as well so that sucker won't go anywhere. There's a little bit of a bow in this plastic trim piece, so I'm going to hold it in place until the Instacure grabs and then it will be permanent. Shouldn't have to clamp it. Okay, that's nice. Now I just have to disguise those awkward looking corners. Yep, we're good. I'm not happy with the raw feeling of this edge, which is no surprise. thinking maybe a touch of Dresden or even just strips of black cardstock something to help frame this area and cover up the ragged looking nature of these edges but from the sides and from the back I'm liking that look sort of rugged and medieval which suits the feeling of this piece I think okay that ought to do it yep that'll be wide enough to cover these edges good okay That's better. We are left with a tiny exposed edge along the exterior. And I'm thinking just the smallest amount of our darkest rust paste dabbed along this edge is going to help marry everything together, disguise anything that looks vaguely raw and it will make the piece just that much more durable. I'm going to let this trim set up fully and turn my attention back to the focal point and the frame. Here I want to go ahead and adhere this little mounting structure behind the face so that this is very sturdy by the time we want to install it. But before I do that, I'm going to stain just the parts of this cardboard that may be exposed once it's installed. Just these edges. And this is just black soot distress stain. That'll dry relatively quickly. Fabri-Tac again. That ought to be plenty. And a couple of drops of Instacure. So I'm just sliding that into place against the curvature of the back and pressing with some force. 
and when the time comes to install this we'll add a lot of adhesive here and it should install beautifully now as to this piece by beginning with a layer of Inca gold old gold on the highlights I think I can live with that I don't think it needs to be any more elaborate than that let's see how it looks can't really tell how I like it until we see how it will look installed and I should temporarily dry fit this piece so it gives us a good idea of where this should finally end up okay we're good time to put it together I'm gonna make sure once that's installed it still looks balanced and I'd say we are good to go there aren't too many points of contact between the face and the frame so I'm hoping we'll be able to get good enough adhesion because it's recessed behind the edges of the piece it shouldn't in theory be jostled too much and I'm putting quite a bit of pressure on this with my fingers giving that insecure an opportunity to bond yeah I think there might be a slight backward tilt there is a slight backward tilt and I'd be happier if there weren't that's better I think we're good yes and with this piece at the bottom and this one at the top we should have a nice finished edge but I'm not sure do I want to just that's pretty precarious if it's perched on the front like that but if I set it back here where it's more secure we have sort of this bland and boring end right here which really just gives us another opportunity to play right so yeah let's go with that and then we'll come back and set the lower piece I'm going to tilt this up so that I can make certain that it's balanced I like it we just need something here to finish off these bare looking sidewalls I'm gonna think about that and come back in a few minutes so I dug through my stash and found a couple of antique buttons from my grandmother's collection and grunge them up just a little bit and affix them in place here at the top and I'm happy enough with that result that feels finished enough looking to me now this area down here at the bottom I'm considering placing a fleur-de-lis in the center here and I have two more of these these were just little wooden fleur-de-lis I think I picked them up at Hobby Lobby and I gave them a coating of rust paste and a little bit of some kind of metallic on the top surface there I can't remember exactly what but it blends in well enough with this piece so I'm thinking I'll take these two other fleur-de-lis and apply them on the sides that's good enough and for the side pieces I'm thinking 
close to the top. And to do the other side, I'll just put down a soft surface. Now these I'm not bothering to add Instacure because they're going on a completely flat surface and Fabri-Tac is more than strong enough to keep them in place. With a placement like this though, where there's a bit of a curvature to the substrate, that Instacure plus Fabri-Tac ought to help this stay in place forever. Okay, so I couldn't resist adding just a few rhinestones here along the front. These are just cheap adhesive back rhinestones from Michaels. And I think because I like to do this, I'm going to add some glossy accents and some microbeads as well. And for microbeads, I think I'll go with this gold tone. I'm liking that effect and I've made a huge mess with the microbeads. What a surprise, right? But I'll zoom in so you can see how they look. Can we get focus? There we go. Yeah. So, yep, as always, I appreciate the richness that those microbeads add. It's really cool. Uh, I think I'll continue along on the side of the work as well, adding more microbeads here. Now for the sides, I think I'd like to soften this transition from the trim downward. So I'll add a bead of glossy accents right along this lower edge and then add a few drips. This little shrine is progressing nicely. I'm relatively happy with where we are. A couple of things, let's see. I wasn't pleased with the stability so I grabbed one of those $1 circular plaques from the craft store and added it to the base here, giving us much increased stability. When we left off, I had added these two antique buttons from my grandmother's collection, and I like the way they finish off those upper corners. Had added just a few of these cheap rhinestones but they're a really pretty sort of amber color and did a tiny bit of microbead work along the front edges here as well. All of that helps the richness of the design to my eye so I'm, I'm pleased with that. On the sides there is again uh, some microbead work and a couple of crystals here. I'm liking that and I'm not sure how much will be done there, but today I wanted to add some more three-dimensional elements to this back panel. This gear motif is from a stencil that I designed and cut and used during the jelly print creation process to make the background paper here. And because we have this gear motif going on, I thought it might be fun to experiment with using some actual three-dimensional elements that reflect that motif. Now, I'm not sure that this is what I'm going to end up actually doing, but I'd like to experiment with it nonetheless. 
a lot of the components I have in here are sort of a coppery or steel finish and that's not going to complement what we're doing so I'm going to hunt through and find the ones that have a sort of bronze finish to them and I don't want to go overboard on this but I think having a nice mixture of sizes to these pieces will help in the long run now this is all tippy because of the elements on the front so I'm going to take a folded piece of fabric to help nestle the front here so it's not quite so unstable so now it's just a question of working with these pieces and trying to create a kind of 3d collage that supports the theme but doesn't become overwhelming yeah i think that's enough to add some interest and to get these affixed to the surface of the paper i'm reaching for insta-cure fabri-tac would certainly do the job but insta-cure is so fast and super effective. I've just decided that's the way I want to go. That will do. Just a little bit of dimensionality on that flat plane is enough to please me. Reaching for the Inca Gold, Old Gold again, and I'll just touch the high points of some of these pieces. And to continue the same treatment, I'll be adding a few of these rhinestones back here as well. And I don't really think it needs much more sparkle than that. So I'm going to stop there and use some triple thick to seal and protect those areas with the rhinestones. I like to cover the stone itself with the triple thick which doesn't interfere with the gleam at all and that ensures a really good bond although that's not its main function triple thick is an excellent adhesive as well so by adding a layer to these decorative pieces we're also enhancing the longevity of the piece. Now the triple thick will have a slightly milky look to it when it's first applied in a thick layer and that will become transparent and it will lose that blue cast that you see here as it cures. But that adds a nice layer of interest to what otherwise would be just a flat piece of paper. However, it also makes it impossible for me to continue to work on this until this cures because I don't want to interfere with the finish that we've just applied. So I'll be setting this aside somewhere safe and come back to it once the triple thick has had an opportunity to cure. And that should be a couple of hours. The focal point of the shrine, of course, is this figure's face. I'm loving the intensity of the metallic coupled with the rough grunginess of the rust paste. And the little pediment here is just die cut and embellished metal tape. Love that stuff. It's incredible. And the whole thing's been uh, embellished with a few rhinestones and coated with triple thick so this will last for years. It's not flimsy at all. The back has been embellished with three-dimensional elements in addition to the underlying jelly print and rust paste and microbeads. So it's a very tactile piece but it's actually quite rugged and the whole thing was mounted on a wooden candlestick that's been treated with rust paste and Inca gold. And the bottom is protected with just 
a sheet of self-adhesive craft foam. This stuff works great to protect your furniture. So thank you for joining me for this little walkthrough of my latest mixed media shrine. It was a joy to make and it's intended for a close friend. I'm hoping she loves it. Thanks for watching. Bye.